Welcome back to Esther's Legacy, for we are here for such a time as this. Today we are going to focus on chapter 10 of Revelation. But before we go to chapter 10, I want to read the last few verses of chapter 9 just to kind of get our setting. We are skipping over the trumpets, okay? So even at the end of the trumpets, so far chapters 8 and 9, have gone through six of the trumpets and we will be between in chapter 10 between trumpet six and trumpet seven so let me set the stage for us by reading the last few verses in chapter nine starting with verse 20. the rest of mankind those who were not killed by these plagues even then did not turn from what they had made with their own hands, they did not stop worshiping demons and idols made of silver, gold, bronze, stone, and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they turn from their murdering, their involvement with the occult and with drugs or sorcery. Sorcery. <laughs> with sorcery okay their sexual immorality or their stealing okay so that's our stage so even after those six trumpets people were still not turning from evil they were not turning from the demonic they were not turning from their evil ways they were not turning from the ways of of Babylon all right so that leads us into chapter 10 which begins next I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven he was dressed in a cloud with a rainbow over his head his face was like the Sun his legs like columns of fire and he had a little scroll lying open in his hand he planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land and shouted in a voice as loud as the roar of a lion and when he shouted seven thunderclaps sounded with voices that spoke and when the seven thunder thunder spoke i was about to write but I heard a voice from heaven say, Seal up the things the seven thunders said. Do not write it down. Okay. This is another mighty angel. Remember, we saw another mighty angel in chapter 5. And we wondered if that was Gabriel. Because he was heralding someone to come forth to open the scroll. Okay, so here we have another mighty angel, and this mighty angel has a scroll in his hand, and it is opened, which is very interesting. Okay, it's open because we've already been through the seals that have been opened, but he has a scroll in his hand that's been opened. And the description of this angel is very reminiscent of the description we see of Yeshua in Daniel chapter 10, in Ezekiel chapter 1, and in Revelation chapter 1. But here it is distinctly an angel, a mighty angel, another mighty angel. And just like the angel in chapter 5, was calling forth Yeshua, so was a different being than Yeshua, so is this. This is another mighty angel, like the one who was calling Yeshua forth. And yet his description is so similar to the description that we have already studied of Yeshua. Who, who is this? Who could this be? I personally believe, and I could be wrong, this is just my opinion, I believe this is more than likely Michael. 
And I have my reasons for saying that. And it is because he is standing on the sea and on the land. He's standing. But this image of, I'm just going to call him Michael. This image of Michael that we see that is so similar to Yeshua. I believe one one reason why he has this strong godly image upon him is because he's so close to the throne. He's so close to Yeshua. This is the angel that Yeshua left in charge of the battle in chapter 10 of Daniel. This is the one who fights for God's people. This is God's top general you have God who is Lord of hosts you have Yeshua who is the commander of hosts and then you have the top general of the, that host and that is Michael and that is who this seems to be because he comes and he stands with this open scroll in his hand And he plants his feet, the right foot on the sea, and the left foot on the land. He is standing, which I find very reminiscent of Daniel chapter 12. Let's turn there to Daniel chapter 12. The very beginning of the chapter where it says, when the when that time comes michael the great prince who champions your people will stand up and there will be a time of distress unparalleled between the time they between the time they became a nation and that moment so israel is going to see a time of distress unparalleled when Michael stands up. Okay. And then it goes on to talk about resurrection. But Michael at the very end stands up. He is the one who champions Israel, who champions God's people. And so he has his right foot on, on the sea. Okay, could that be a literal C? Yes, because we know that things happen literally to the C. But again, the C is also reminiscent of the nations. The land, is that literal land? Yes, we know that things literally happen to the land. But at the same time, could it be that his foot is also on Israel? Okay, defending the people of God and even continuing to maybe fight forces in the land that are against those who are for God. Michael stands and he stands to fight and he fights against the nations and the spirits of the nations, and he defends the people of God. Okay? When he stands, he shouts in a voice as loud as the roar of a lion. Like a lion, he roars. All right? I want to look at some passages here. I want to start, I'm going to start with Isaiah 31, 4. Isaiah 31, 4. And we're going to see the roar of a lion. For here is what Adonai says to me as a lion 
or lion cub growls at its prey and isn't frightened away by the shouts. The hordes of shepherds called out against him. Their voices do not upset him. So likewise, Adonai Zavoot will descend to fight on Mount Zion on his hill. So as a lion or lion cub growls at its prey and isn't afraid or frightened away by the shout of those who have come against him, neither will God be afraid of the enemy. Okay, so this shout here is... I'm going to, you know, this, this lion, this lion here is God. I'm not afraid of the enemy. And so God comes out like a lion. So here, this mighty angel is a representative of God coming out like a lion. Now let's go to Jeremiah, um, Jeremiah 25, 30. As for you, Jeremiah, prophesy all these words against them. Say to them, Adonai is roaring from on high. Adonai is roaring from on high, raising his voice from his holy dwelling, roaring with might against his own habitation, shouting out loud like those that tread grapes against everyone living on earth the sound resounds to the ends of the earth for Adonai is indicting the nations about the past judgment and about to pass judgment on all mankind the wicked he has handed over to the sword do you hear that? Do you hear that? And it goes on to say that Adonai says, Thus says Adonai Zavuot, Disaster is spreading from nation to nation. A mighty tempest is being unleashed from the farthest ends of the earth. Okay? So here we have Michael shouting like a lion. And that lion's roar is reminiscent of God's roar as he comes to fight his enemies. And he's even talking about here in Jeremiah, treading them like grapes, which is very interesting because when we get a few more chapters over, we're, we are going to see the treading, God treading like grapes. Okay? The nations. So that's, that's very interesting that we see that in connection to God roaring. And here, again, this is something, Michael sounds like a lion roaring. He's reminiscent of God. He is, in essence, extremely close to the image of God. And that is reflecting from him. That is who he is. Everything he does reflects what God tells him to do. Everything. Okay? So we have this lion's roar. Now let's go to Hosea chapter 11, verse 10. Hosea chapter 11, verse 10. Where it says, they will go after Adonai. They, they will go after Adonai who will roar like a lion. For he will roar and the children will come trembling from the west. They will tremble like a bird as they come from Egypt. Like a dove they come from the land of Asher. And I will resettle them in their houses. God roars okay so 
again, we see that Michael here is, is echoing, in essence, the roar of God. So we, then we see that the thunders spoke. The thunders spoke. When Michael sounds like a lion, the thunder spoke. And in chapter 4 of Revelation, verse 5, we see that from the throne came forth lightnings, voices, and thunderings. From the throne. So are these thunderings, are these seven thunders coming from the throne saying something that John can hear, but that God does not want him to write down. And so he is told to seal it up. Rather reminiscent of when Daniel is told up to seal up the book of Daniel, to seal up the prophecy. Seal it up. You've heard it, Daniel. But it's not for mass consumption right now. Seal it up. And so John is in essence being told the same thing about these seven thunders, these perfect and complete thunders speaking that Daniel was told. Seal it up. All right. Now let's go on to verse 5. And then the angel I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted his right hand toward heaven, put his right hand toward heaven, and swore by the one who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, earth and what is in it, the sea and what is in it. Michael, this angel, this mighty angel, who I believe to be Michael, who's standing on the sea and on the land, he lifts up his right hand and swears by the one who lives forever and ever. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. And we are going to look at verses 40 to 43. For I lift up my hand to heaven and swear as surely as I am alive forever. As surely as I am alive forever. So this is God talking. And God is saying, I lift up my hand to heaven and swear by myself. As surely as I am alive forever, if I... I sharpen my flashing sword and set my hand to judgment. I will render vengeance to my foes and repay those who hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood. My sword will devour flesh. The blood of the slain and the captives, flesh from the wild-haired heads of the enemy. Sing out, you nations, about his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants, and he will render vengeance on his adversaries, or to his adversaries, and make atonement for the land of his people. So God is coming and he swears by himself that he will take vengeance on those who hate him. And he will avenge his people and their land, atone their land. And isn't that exactly what we see in the book of Revelation. <laughs> and so here we see this mighty angel lifting his right hand 
and swearing by the one who lives forever. He's going to He's going to, we're going to go over what he swears in just a moment, okay? Now let's look at Daniel chapter 12 again. Daniel chapter 12. And let's look at verse 7. The man dressed in linen who was above the water of the river, raised his right hand, his right and left hands toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times and a half, and that it will be when the power of the evil people is no longer being shattered, that all these things will end. This is Yeshua. The man in linen is the man from Daniel chapter 10 in linen. This is Yeshua. This is the one. It's not Michael. Because the man in linen, remember, comes to give a, a, a report, comes to talk to Daniel, and leaves Michael in charge of the fight in Persia. The man in linen is Yeshua. Okay, so here we see Yeshua raising both his hands and swearing by the one who lives forever. He swears by his father that the duration of the time of great distress would be time, times, and half a time. Okay, so three and a half years. Okay, and it would last until... The people, the holy people, God's people, are no longer being shattered. And why are they, why aren't they being shattered anymore? Because He's come to end it. And once He's done, it's done. That time's over. Okay. So we see God Himself doing this. Raising his hand to heaven and swearing by himself. We see Yeshua raising both hands and swearing by his father. We see Michael raising his right hand and swearing by the father, the one who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Okay? So what does he swear In many ways, he's swearing to obey the command of God because what is, what does he say? He begins by saying, there will be no more delay. I am standing. The fight has begun. Michael is on the sea and on the land. He is standing. He is there to defend God's people and to fight the enemies of God. The fight has begun. And he is here on earth, standing. The fight has come down. The fight that was in the heavenlies has come down. And the fight is taking place here. But there's no more delay. And it's not just that the fight has come. There's no more delay in the fight. That's not specifically what Michael's talking about here. Although the fight has commenced on earth. He's here to defend and fight the enemies of God. No. He is saying here that there will be no more delay on the contrary, in the days of the sound of the seventh angel, when he sounds his shofar, so with that last shofar sounds, that seventh shofar, when the sounds of the shofars are complete, the hidden plan of God, the mystery of God, will be brought to completion. It'll be done. 
what Yeshua began on the cross, that payment he made in full, therefore the payment was done, that was finished. Okay? Here, the full plan, the full hidden plan, the full mystery of God will be brought to, be, to completion. It will be done. What is that? The good news as he proclaimed it to his servants, the prophets. The good news. The good news of his servants, the prophets. Let's look at Let's look at Romans 16, 25 through 27. Romans 16, 25 to 27 says, Now to God, who can strengthen you according to, the, to my good news, in harmony with the revelation of of the secret truth or hidden mystery, the, the mystery, the hidden or secret truth, which is the proclamation of Yeshua, the Messiah, kept hidden in silence for ages and ages, but manifested now through prophetic writings in keeping with the command of God, the eternal, the everlasting God, and communicated it to the Gentiles to provoke in to promote, I'm sorry, to promote in them trust grounded obedience or faithful obedience to the only wise God through Yeshua the Messiah be the glory forever and ever. So that the hidden mystery that's going to be brought to completion is the complete revealing of Yeshua. When he comes and takes his throne, because the first revealing of Yeshua in his first coming did not complete everything that the prophets spoke of. And one of the things that the prophets spoke of that the prophets didn't quite understand was even the inclusion of the Gentiles into the kingdom of the Messiah. Okay, let's look at Amos chapter 3. Amos chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. And we're going to see the lion roaring again here, too, which is really interesting. Adonai, God, does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. The lion has roared. Who will not fear? Adonai, God, has spoken. Who will not prophesy? So God does nothing without revealing it first to his prophets. And he did reveal it to his prophets. They just didn't quite understand it. Yeshua came, fulfilled the part that needed to be fulfilled when he came the first time, and spoke of his coming again. Even before his death, he spoke of coming again to fulfill the rest of what God had said. In the meantime, he sent his disciples out to tell the world, to make disciples of all the world, of all the nations, to make disciples. All right. So we're going to read quite a bit here. So hang with me, if you will. Let's look at Ephesians 
well, let's start. Let's start with the Tanakh first. Let's first look at um, Isaiah chapter forty-nine. Verses 5 and 6 that says, So now Adonai says, He formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Yaakov, to bring Jacob back to him, and have Israel gathered to him, so that I will be honored in the sight of Adonai my God, having become my strength. Okay. Who's talking here? Hmm? Who's this about? Yes, it's about Isaiah, but ultimately, who is this about? This is about Yeshua. Okay? He has said, It is not enough that you are merely my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the offspring of Israel. I will also make you a light to the nations. So my serv so my salvation, my Yeshua, so my salvation can spread to the ends of the earth. All right? So here we have this promise of the one who would come and bring not only Israel back to God, restore Israel back to God, but also to be a light to the nations and that the salvation he brings would go to the ends of the earth. Now, let's look at chapter 51, verses 4 through 8. Pay attention to me, my people, my nation. Listen to me, for Torah will go out from me, the law, the Torah, will go out from me, I will calm them with my justice. The Torah, the Mosaic Covenant, okay, will go out from me, I will calm them with my justice as a light for the peoples. His justice, his Torah, is a light to the peoples. The coastlands are putting their hope in me, trusting in my arm. Rise, or raise your eyes toward the skies. Look at the earth below. The skies will vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like clothing. Those living on it will die like flies, but my salvation will be forever. And my justice, my justice, it comes from Torah. Okay, so his salvation and his Torah will never end. Listen to me, you who know justice, you people who have my Torah, who have my law, my Torah in your heart. Don't be afraid of people's taunts and don't be upset by their insults. For the moth will eat them up like clothing, the worm will eat them like wool, but my justice will be forever and my salvation for all generations. That salvation and his justice that the salvation and atonement that Yeshua brings through his death, burial, and resurrection and his Torah, his word, go together. That the complete fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant go together. And what is that? And, and also even the Davidic covenant, his kingship, right? What is that that brings all of those together in completion? Isn't that the new covenant when his Torah is on our heart? Now let's go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 32. And of course we know that the new covenant is spoken of in chapter 31. Where he puts his Torah on our heart. But let's look at Jeremiah 32 verses 36 through 41. It says... 
Therefore, thus says Adonai, the God of Israel, concerning this city, of which you say that it is handed over to the king of Babel by sword, famine, and plague. I will gather them out of all the countries where I drove them in my anger, for fury, and great wrath. And I will bring them back to this place and have them live here in safety. They will be my people and I will be their God. I will give them singleness of heart and singleness of purpose. Is there singleness of heart and singleness of purpose in the people of God today? Is there singleness of heart and purpose in the people of modern day Israel today? Hmm. This is speaking of a day where there's singleness of heart and purpose. When his Torah is on our hearts. So that they will fear me forever. Are there people who live in the land today who do not fear God? Are there people who believe in Yeshua that don't really fear God? This will be for their own good and for the good of their children after them. I will make with them an everlasting covenant, the new covenant, right? That brings them all together and completes them all. An everlasting covenant not to turn away from them but to do them good i will put fear of me in their hearts so that they will not leave me i will take joy in them so as to do them good i will plant them in this land truly with my whole heart and being with God's whole heart and being, he's going to plant his people in his land. He's going to do them good. He's going to be their God and they're going to be his people. The completion. And of course, we know about Zechariah. I'm sorry, not Zechariah, but we know about Ezekiel. Chapter 37, we've read it before, starting in verse 15, where Ezekiel is told to take the stu two sticks and put them together. And God says, there'll be one shepherd over my people, David. So the son of David is going to be the shepherd of all his people, right? They have one shepherd. They have one king. They have a singleness of heart and singleness of purpose. They have his Torah in their heart. All right. That brings us to Yeshua. And what did Yeshua ask of the Father? Yeshua taught his disciples to pray. Yes. But the prayer in the heart of Yeshua, the thing he talked to his father about right before he was arrested, what was it? We see that in John chapter 17. John chapter 17, starting in verse 20. Of course, he asked the father that he set his disciples apart, that he set his followers apart just as God set, had set him apart to do the work that the father had given him to do now the now Yeshua is going to be giving them work to do and he needs them set apart okay he needs them to be holy and set apart but beginning in verse 20 he says this I pray not only for these, so he prayed directly for his disciples, but also for those who will trust in me because of their word, not that they may be, I'm sorry, there's no not in there, is there? That they may be one, singleness of heart, singleness of purpose, that they may be one, just as you, Father, are united with me 
and I with you. I pray that they may be united with us so that the world may believe that you sent me. I want to say something about that here. Even in Revelation, we, we start out this study today by reading about things um, even after the trumpets that people still are not going to believe. They're still not going to stop worshiping the demons. To know that God sent the Son does not mean that they will put their faith and their trust in him. Because if you remember the Exodus, there were times that when the Egyptians finally understood that God had sent Moses, when they finally understood who God, the true God was, it was too late. They understood that at their death. So that the Egyptians will know. So that Pharaoh will know. How did Pharaoh know? Did it take the death of his son? So, and then he still went after the people of God and died in the, in the sea. So just because they know doesn't mean they believe. They're going to know. But they're still going to come out against him to fight. They're going to know who he is. They're going to know where he's from. And they're still going to come out to fight. Okay? So we need to understand that. Okay? But our oneness with each other and with him still speaks loudly and clearly to the world. That God sent his son. So let's continue. Verse 22. The glory which you have given to me, I have given to them, so that they may be one, just as we are one. I united with them, and you with me, so that they may be completely one. Not partly, but completely one. And the world thus realize that you sent me and that you have loved them just as you have loved me. And what did the world do to him? Okay. But he's praying that we would be one because that, that speaks loudly to the world of truth. The truth of who he is and where he's from and who sent him. Okay? That there is a God in heaven. All right. Now, we're going to read quite a bit out of Ephesians because Ephesians is filled with the this idea of the oneness of God's people and the importance of it. I start in chapter 1 of Ephesians with verses 7 through uh, 14. Now, I want to say something here for a moment. When I read these verses and you see um, the term we as I begin to read, that we is speaking of the people of Israel. God's first fruits, those he had chosen, okay? We know that because Paul transitions in the chapter. And then only after he transitions does he include everybody in a collective us or our, okay? So let's, let's read, starting in verse 7. In union with him, through the shedding of his blood, we are set free our sins are forgiven this accords with the wealth of the grace he has lavished on us in all his wisdom and insight 
he made known to us his secret plan. That mystery, that hidden plan of God. So he made known to us his secret plan, which by his own will he designed beforehand in connection with the Messiah. So even beforehand, for the foundations of the world, God knew, Yeshua and Yeshua knew, what was going to be. The plan was already in motion. And will put into effect when the time is ripe. His plan to place everything in heaven and on earth under the Messiah's headship. <coughs> so, in other words, the secret plan is to place everything under Yeshua, everything under the Messiah. There will be no more delay. What is the book of Revelation about? About the revealing of the one that is hidden, along with that hidden plan, right? To reveal the one who is hidden or veiled. So his plan to place everything in heaven and on earth under the Messiah's headship. Also, in union with him, we were given an inheritance. We who were picked in advance according to the purpose of the one who affects everything in keeping with the decision of his will. And who was chosen? Israel was chosen in advance. Okay. They're part of the plan. So that we, who earlier had put our hope in the Messiah, would bring him praise, commensurate, and commensurate with his glory. Okay. Praise commensurate with his glory. Furthermore, you, here he transitions. So I'm going to ask a question. Did Moses believe in the Messiah? Yes, he did. He knew one would come. Did Isaiah believe in the Messiah? Yes, he knew one would come. Did Zechariah believe in the Messiah? Yes, he did. Okay. Okay. So even Israel, those who truly put their faith in God, believed that he would one day send the one who would rule, who would truly be the king of Israel. Okay, so now Paul transitions from the we to the you. Furthermore, you, you Gentiles, who heard the message of truth, the good news offering you deliverance, offering you salvation, and put your trust, your faith in the Messiah, were sealed by him with the promised Ruach HaKodesh, with the promised Holy Spirit. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit, who guarantees, now here comes that collective R that includes the Gentiles, who guarantees our, all of us, our inheritance. That's the mystery. That's the secret plan, that it's all of ours. It belongs to all of us with him as the head. Until we come into possession of it and thus bring him praise commensurate with his glory. Bring him praise. All right. Now let's go to chapter 2. And I'm going to read all of chapter or verses 11 through 22. Okay. We read many of these each week on Shabbat for those of you who are at Restoration Fellowship, Restoration Messianic Fellowship. So let's begin in, in verse 11. Therefore, remember, and of course, I'm reading out of the complete Jewish Bible. Okay. I'm not reading out of the TLV, which is what we usually read. Okay, so if it sounds a little different, that's why. All right, so therefore, remember your former state, you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcised by those who merely 
because of an operation or something done in their flesh are called the circumcised. At that time, had no Messiah. So the Gentiles had no Messiah. We weren't part of those who were chosen at the beginning of chapter 1 of Ephesians. You were estranged from the national life of Israel. Okay? You were foreigners to the covenants embodying God's promise. Where, where, where's God's promise at? They're in the covenants. All of them. All of them contain his covenants. All of them. The blessing and the cursing, the blessings for his people that he wants to pour out on them and do them good because he is their God and, he, and they are his people, that's in the Mosaic Covenant. Those blessings are in the Mosaic Covenant. So all of the covenants. You were foreigners to the covenants, embodying God's promise. You were in his in this world without hope and without God. You didn't have God with you. You had your pagan idols. You had demons with you. You didn't have God with you. But now, you who once were far off, far off from God, far off, have been brought near through the shedding of Messiah's blood, through the shedding work of Messiah. For he himself is our shalom, is our peace. He has made us both one and has broken down the hostility, the hatred which divided us by destroying in his own body the enmity occasion, destroying in his own body the enmity or the hatred occasioned by the Torah with its commandments set forth in the form of ordinances. I'm going to stop right there because this is a verse that is often misunderstood. That wall of separation of enmity and hatred was a literal wall. It was literal. Okay? It was a wall erected on the Temple Mount with a sign in Greek placed upon it that said, if you pass this line and you are a Gentile, prepare to die, basically. You will be stoned. You are taking your life into your hands if you pass by this wall. That wall is called the, was called the Sorek, and it separated the court of the women from the court of the Gentiles on the Temple Mount. Okay? It is another courtyard, so to speak. It's not the inner courtyard. It's not the outer courtyard. It is another courtyard, the court of the courtyard of the Gentiles that they created based on their hatred and their enmity for the Gentiles. Now, granted, I believe that wall was actually put up more than likely by the Hasmonean um, dynasty because they had seen God's courts trampled and an abomination of desolation set up in his temple and a pig, a, an unclean pig slaughtered on the altar, desecrating the altar of God. They had seen that. And so what were they saying with that wall? Never again. Never again. It's an interesting statement. Isn't it? That's basically what they were saying. We're not going to let you come in here and let you do what happened before. We will warn you, if you come in here, you, you, you might as well consider yourself as good as dead. Because we're coming for you. We're going to 
kill you. Because they had seen that happen before. And so they took that and put up that wall, said never again, basically. And that enmity and that hatred, that, that hostility, it grew within their hearts. Okay, now, the idea that it was put there by the Torah, let me explain something. Even the Torah gives provisions for the judges of Israel to make decisions. Okay? And so they took that permission to make decisions, to make judgments, and erected this wall. And it became an ordinance that no Gentile would pass past that wall. Well, what did Yeshua do? Yeshua, in his death, tore down that wall. He is saying there should not be a separation between my people, whether they are native-born Jew or a Gentile, whether they were formerly near me or formerly far away from me. I have brought them all near. And there's not to be a separation between them. I did not give my Torah for the purpose of you making judgments and ordinances to separate my people. You've used it for that purpose, but that's not the purpose I gave it for. Okay? And so he tears down that dividing wall. That wall was to come down in his people. He did this in order to create in union with himself from the two groups a single new humanity, one new man. You are all my people. And thus make shalom peace doesn't matter if you were formerly near or formerly far away if you have come to me i have brought you all near and in that there is peace there is shalom no more hatred no more hostility and, and in order to reconcile to god both in a single body one singleness of heart, singleness of purpose, by being executed, by being crucified, and thus in himself killing that enmity and that hostility, that hatred. Also, when he came, he announced the good news Shalom, peace to you far off and peace to those nearby. Okay. He came and he announced that good news of Shalom. News that through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. We both have access. We both can come before God. None of us have to be kept at bay. So then, you are no longer foreigners and strangers. To what? To the commonwealth of Israel, to the nation of Israel, to, to the covenants. On the contrary, you are fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's family. You, you Gentiles, are fellow citizens with us. Members of God's family with us, right? With, with the chosen people, with Israel, native-born Israel, who put their faith and trust in Messiah. 
You have been built on the foundation of the emissaries and prophets, of the apostles and the prophets. That's your foundation. And with the cornerstone being Yeshua, the Messiah himself. In union with him, the whole building, <clears throat> the whole temple of God, the whole building is held together. And it is growing into a holy temple in union with the Lord. Yes, in union with him, you yourselves are being built together into a single dwelling place for God. God is bringing all of us close. He wants none of us to stay far away from him, to be kept at arm's, arm's length. He wants us all to be brought near. Now let's go to chapter 4. We've seen that union. We've seen him bringing us together as one, right? And Ezekiel, the two sticks of Ephraim or Joseph, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom of Judah, are being brought together as one. And here in Ephesians, we see that whether we were Gentile or Jews, in Yeshua, we're all under that one shepherd, under our king. We are being brought together as one. Okay? Chapter 4, verse 4 says, There is one body. There is one. Made up of Jew and Gentile. All of us together. One. One body. And one spirit. Just as when you were called... You were called to one hope. One spirit that seals you. The Holy Spirit. The Ruach HaKodesh. Who seals you. Why? He seals you. Because he's guaranteeing the inheritance. Our inheritance together. Okay? Just as when you were called, you were called to one hope, and there is one Lord, one trust, one faith, one immersion, one baptism, one that brings you into the kingdom, okay, that has that purpose. And one God, the Father of all, who rules over all, works through all, and is in all. Amen. And in Revelation chapter 10 right here, he's even working through Michael. Right? All right, now let's go to chapter 5. We're going to um, read verses 22 through 32. Okay? 22 through 32 say this. Wives should submit to their husbands as they do to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife, just as the Messiah, as head of the Messianic community, as the head of the church, is himself the one who keeps the body safe. Just as the Messianic community submits to the Messiah, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. As for husbands, love your wives. Just as the Messiah loved the Messianic community, indeed, he gave himself up on its behalf, on her behalf, in order to set it apart for God, baking it clean through the immersion in the mikvah, the washing of the water, in the mikvah, so to speak, in order, the washing of the water of the word, right? In order to present the Messianic community to himself as a bride to be proud of without spot, wrinkle, or any such thing, but holy and without defect. This is how husbands ought to love their wives like their own bodies, for the man who loves his wife is loving himself. Why? No one ever hated his own flesh. On the contrary, he feeds it, he feeds it well, and takes care of it, just as the Messiah does the Messianic community, does the church, because 
We are part of his body. Therefore, a man will leave his father and mother and remain with his wife, and the two will become one. This is a profound truth. This is a great mystery hidden. There is a profound truth hidden here. This is a great mystery in this. Which I say concerns the Messiah and the Messianic community. This is about Messiah and his people. They are one. He prayed that they would be one and one with him. Marriage is a picture of the body's relationship to their head, to Messiah. It is a picture, which is one reason, just one of many, why divorce is so horrible. It breaks that picture of who we are supposed to be with him. One, singleness of heart and purpose with him when husband and wife are at odds with each other it is a horrible thing it's a horrible thing that's why god does say, i hate divorce I, I i gave this to you so you would understand the relationship i want with you and so being having that oneness together with each other, with him, for us to be his people and for him to be our God, it's an awesome thing. All of us together, Jew and Gentile together, all of Israel together. All of us. The, the covenants, all of them, are not far from any of us. Shouldn't be. And so Michael in Revelation chapter 10 is saying that this hidden plan of God will be brought to completion. With Yeshua as our head. He is our shepherd. He is our king. He will be our shepherd. He will be our king. We will be his people. He will be our God. God will be over all, through all, and in all. And it will be complete. And it will last forever. The new covenant fulfilled. When does that begin to happen? When is that? When is there no more delay? When that seventh angel sounds his trumpet. Right in that time period. Which is very interesting. Because we see Yeshua in Matthew chapter 24. Speaking of when that trumpet is sounded. When that shofar is sounded. Right? In verse 30. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the tribes of the land will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with tremendous power and glory, and he will send his angels with a great shofar, and they will gather together his chosen people from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other, to give us our inheritance. To give us our inheritance that is safe in heaven with him. All right? The angel blows that shofar, that final shofar. The angels, plural, with a shofar. The complete, the completeness of the blowing of the shofars. Um, some verses you might want to look are Isaiah chapter 27, verses 12 through 13, Zechariah 9, 9 through 16, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52, and of course, 
1 Thessalonians 4, 16. Speak of the trumpet. Speak of the shofar. So go look those up for, uh, on your own. I want to go on in chapter um, 10, starting in verse 8. Next, the voice which I had heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go, take the scroll, lying open in the hand of the angel, standing on the sea and on the land. Go take the scroll. Remember, he had a scroll and it was opened. Is it the scroll Yeshua was opening? We talked about that perhaps being um, the Torah, seeming like it was the Torah. Okay. And now the scroll is opened. His deed, his right to be king, to come and take vengeance on his enemies. That scroll has been opened. Go and take the scroll lying open in the hand of the angel standing on the sea and on the land. So I went over to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it, and in my mouth it was sweet as honey. But after I had swallowed it, my stomach turned bitter. And then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. You must prophesy. It's very interesting. If we go to Ezekiel chapter 22, remember you were supposed to have read Ezekiel. So if you go to Ezekiel chapter 2, you should remember this. Ezekiel is given a scroll to eat. And we see in verse 9, And when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me, holding a scroll, and he opened or, I'm sorry, he spread it out in front of me. So, spread it out, he opened it. And it was covered with writings, front and back. Written on it were laments, dirges, and woes. Are there laments, dirges, and woes in the Torah? Are there curses in the Torah? Because that's what laments, dirges, and woes are. They're curses. Right? Right? Yes, there's curses in the Torah. Okay? And here, Ezekiel is told to eat it. Verse 1 of chapter 3. Son of man, eat what you see in front of you. Eat this scroll. Then go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he gave me the scroll to eat. As I said, as, or as he said, son of man, Eat this scroll I am giving you. Fill your insides with it. When I ate it, it tasted as sweet as honey. Okay? But what was in it? Dirges and woes and laments. Something that would make you sick. Okay? So we see that same idea here that John is being given a scroll to eat. So it, that's been opened, and it must have curses. In other words, laments and dirges and woes upon it because it's as sweet as honey to his mouth. But inside, it turns sour, turns bitter. Sweet as honey. Yes, God taking vengeance on his enemies is sweet. And those who were under the altar have even asked him for how much longer, right? How long, O oh Lord, how long will the wicked prosper? Something the prophets would ask. Like you see in the wisdom literature of scripture, how long will the wicked prosper? And when God finally comes to deal with that, yes, it is sweet, but at the same time, 
It is bitter. It is bitter. No one wants to actually see the bitterness of that time. Okay? But Ezekiel is told to go and prophesy to the people of Israel. John is told to go prophesy to many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. So John is being sent basically to prophesy to Babylon while Ezekiel prophesied to Israel. Now could some of Israel, physical Israel, be involved in that many peoples, nations, languages, and kings? Could be. You see a great divide amongst the people in Israel today. At this point, will there still be that divide? Are there still going to have to be those who need to be prophesied to? But John is told to take those laments and dirges and woes, basically, those curses that turn bitter in his stomach, and prophesy those to the nations. And that is what you see. And the, the, the seals and the bowls, the trumpets and the bowls, right? He is prophesying those woes. And he's prophesying them basically to Babylon, to the world, to the nations. So while God wants his people to be one, for the new covenant to be fully enacted in his people, he will take vengeance on his enemies. And he even tells them, this is coming. That's what John is prophesying for. This is coming. But to bring this whole chapter together, we have to remember who we are to be. And we also have to remember how we started out this study of Revelation, that the testimony of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Yeshua. So that when John prophesies, and if he, when he even prophesies the woes and the curses, it is always for the hope of Redemption that they would turn until obviously there will come a time when it's too late. But until then, there's always hope and the hope for redemption. But even when that hope is gone, the enemy knows, is going to know what is coming. Michael will stand. And he will fight. And he will roar like a lion. The battle, God will bring his battle here. And there will be a fight for the people of this world. And for the land. Until the commander of God's army comes and steps foot on this earth and finishes the battle himself. Amen? But there is hope in this chapter that the new covenant will be fulfilled and there will be no more delay when Michael sets down his feet on the sea and on the earth. This mighty angel of God when he stands, when he stands, it will begin. And so, in essence, you might say, we've kind of gone back in time to the beginning of the three and a half years because Yeshua in Daniel 12 said that that time would last three and a half years. Okay? But for the purpose, even of making his people one. So... 
Your homework, of course, is to look up those verses I just gave you that talk about the, the trumpet and also to continue in uh, Jeremiah or Ezekiel if you're not finished with that, to just continue to read the prophets, okay? Um, right now we're on the, the homework I've given you at this point is up to uh, Jeremiah. So I hope that you are blessed this week. I hope that God is blessing you and your family. And y'all, today, as I record this, is the ninth of all. And so I also want to um, say I hope you are having a blessed fast as you remember the destruction of the temples with the hope that God will restore true worship to his people, that he will fulfill in its entirety the new covenant, that we will be his people and he will be our God, and that he will bring us all close to him and keep none of us at arm's length. Amen? Amen. Hope you have a blessed week. Shalom.